Our scripture this morning is from the book of Numbers, verses, chapter 21, verses 8 and 9, and I'm reading from the New Living Word. Living Word? Yeah. It says inspire. So, so Numbers, chapter 21, verses 8 and 9. Then the Lord told him, Make a replica of a poisonous snake and attach it to a pole. All who are bitten will live if they simply look at it. So Moses made a snake out of bronze and attached it to a pole. Then anyone who was bitten by a snake could look at the bronze snake and be healed. We ask the Lord's blessing on the reading of his word and that he will open our eyes to deeper meanings in his word. We look forward to what Dan has to share with us. Good morning. You know, as you go through the week and you listen to the radio or you turn on a television and you listen to the news, things look pretty bleak sometimes. You know, if you listen to, listen to all of that, the future looks pretty bleak and pretty shaky. You know, and you start going, man, what's going on here? Am I going to make it through? And then you open your checkbook and you go, hmm, am I going to make it through the month? Am I going to pay all the bills? And sometimes that looks pretty shaky, too. If we listen to all of those things and we worry about those things, we really wonder, what is our future like? Is it shaky? Is there a failure? But I want to tell you today that your future is secure. And I want to start by looking at Numbers chapter 21. And if we turn there, I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation also. I'll be switching back and forth today as we go through some scripture with this and also the New King James. But before we read verses 4 through 9, let's give a little history to what's going on. Uh, Aaron had just died. And then they take and they go up against the Canaanites and they win. And they're pretty feeling pretty good about themselves about a victory over the Canaanites. And now they're they're starting to wander again in the in the desert. And the people are getting a little disgruntled. not realizing that what's really going on around them about God's protection for them. God's been taking care of them. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff that, is, stuff that they hadn't noticed, like the poisonous snakes around them. But God has been protecting them from these venomous snakes. He's supplying their food. He's supplying their water. He is supplying everything they need. And then they start grumbling. So let's take start looking at verse 4 of of chapter 21 of the book of Numbers. Then the people of Israel set out from Mount Hor 
taking the road to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people grew impatient with the long journey, and they began to speak against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness, they complained. There's nothing to eat here and nothing to drink, and we hate this horrible manna. Okay, let's stop there for just a moment. The land that they're traveling in isn't going to support that many people. And God's provided water for them. He's provided manna. Now they think that they're going to die in the wilderness. And they think that they're starving. That there's nothing to eat. Nothing to drink. And we hate this horrible manna. You know, when I take and I read scripture, I like to put it into, how does it re- relate to us? You ever have those things that everything's going good and then all of a sudden it doesn't go quite the way you want it to go? That's ah, taken longer. You know, they're on a longer journey than what they thought it was going to be. And now nothing's right. God's been providing for us all along, and now we start grumbling. And we even hate what he's provided for us that's going to take care of us. And that's what they're doing. I mean, we can take and sit, when we read this, we take and we criticize them, saying, what are they, stupid? You know, look at what all that God's done for them. And then we look in the mirror, and we have to go, what are you, stupid? God's been taking care of you. But human nature takes over, and this is what's going on here, and how we relate to this. These things show us really what is going on with us also. That we fall into these same traps. And we start to complain and we start turning away and we don't like anything that God's doing and we drive God away from us. And when we do, his protection starts lifting from us because we don't want anything to do with him you know if all you're going to do is complain how you know let me let me back off a little bit and that's what god did he backed off his protection from them and it says here so the lord sent poisonous snakes among them they were already there And he had been protecting them. And he's lifted his hand to protection some. And people are getting bitten and they died. Then the people came to Moses and cried out, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take away the snakes. So Moses prayed for the people. You know, how many times... That we're, we're in situations, we pray that God will take that situation away. And he doesn't always take them away. You know, he tells us that in this world you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. He doesn't promise to take them away, but he says that I will make a way of escape for you. And here he doesn't take the snakes away. Because if we continue reading, it says the Lord told him to make a replica of a poisonous snake and attach it to a pole. All who are bitten will live if they simply will look at it. If he took them away, they wouldn't need the, the serpent on the pole. But he says all that are all that are bitten, if they look at that, they'll be healed. So Moses made a snake out of bronze and attached it to a pole. 
Then anyone who was bitten by the snake could look at the bronze snake and be healed. There was an anti-venom. And all they had to do is look at that bronze snake on a pole. The people realized that, you know what? This is crazy, but it's working. All we have to do is look at it. We don't have to eat anything. We don't have to have any shots. We don't have to take any medicine. We don't have to do anything. All we have to do is look at it. And it was to prove to them of God's ultimate protection. We see that this is a symbol of Christ being nailed to the cross. That he has provided an anti-venom for sin. The deadly poisonous sin that we, we take into our lives. But you know, Revelation says that that serpent. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12. In verse 9 it says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So, you know, that bronze serpent represented sin. But we also know that that was about Jesus also. So why was it a serpent on the pole if it's a representation of Christ? Anybody get an idea? How about Jesus was made sin for us? That he took our sins and, nailed, and he was nailed to the cross. He became sin so we could have his righteousness. You want to talk about an anti venom for sin? It's Jesus. Now let's go to the New Testament. Let's go to John. And we're going to go to chapter 3 of the book of John. Let's, we'll break some of this stuff down as we go along. There was a man named Nicodemus. We're going to start in verse 1. A Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Okay. So what does this tell us about Nicodemus? He was a religious leader. What else was he? He was scared of people's opinions. Yes, to some extent. Yeah, I would say so. But he was afraid of, he was afraid of people's opinions of him. That's why he came after dark. But what else was he? He came. He was a seeker. There's one other thing, though, that it says right out to what he was. He was a Pharisee. So he gave his belief systems by telling what, what he was. That he was a leader. <clears throat> 
And he noticed something about Jesus. He says, God sent you. He's, he, he could see that. You know, <clears throat> in studying about Nicodemus, Nicodemus was looking forward to the Messiah. And he wasn't totally happy with what was going on. And he was hoping, he saw the bigotry of the, of the nation. And he was hoping that when Messiah came, that things would be different. That things would change. And so he comes to Jesus in, in the nighttime. Because he doesn't want to be thought of being one of his followers. The Pharisees weren't really in enthralled with Jesus and he comes and he says to him I, we know that you are that God has sent you to teach us you know your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you he says so we're seeing this and he's acknowledging that Jesus is sent by God and Jesus replies tells him, he says, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. He says, unless you are born again, you will not see everything. You might see a little bit, but you're not going to understand. And he's telling this to Nicodemus for Nicodemus to give his heart to God. To really give it to God. Do you think that God speaks to us the same way today? How many people there have been a Pharisee? How many people have been afraid of what other people's opinions are about you following Jesus? You know, and and you know, Jesus says, and we know that Jesus is sent of God. We see his miracles. We experience his miracles sometimes. But do we really see him to the full extent? Are we born again? Nicodemus says, what do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? <clears throat> How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of the water and the spirit. It says you can't enter the kingdom of God? What are you talking about? That's what Nicodemus is saying. And, and why the water and the spirit? Let's turn to Matthew chapter 3 for a moment. John the Baptist is at, at the River Jordan. And Jesus comes to him, verse 13. Then Jesus went from Galilee to, Jordan, to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to talk him out of it. He says, I am the one who needs to be baptized by you, he said. And why are you coming to me? But Jesus said, it should be done. For we must carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to be agreed to baptize him. You know, in the King James it says to Jesus says we must fulfill all righteousness. So baptism by water 
is a requirement of God according to this translation. It's what God requires. And the other translations it says we must fulfill all righteousness. So is baptism is a sign of righteousness. A sign of taking on Christ's righteousness. You know, if we go back in history, back from there, we go back to before the fall in the Garden of Eden, what was the sign of righteousness? What? I'm not kidding. Before the fall. That was the robe of righteousness, yeah. And, a, and the sign would be, what did God command them to do? He, on the seventh day, he said to worship him. Right? That he rested and that they were to rest. It was a day set apart. And that was... Their, their sign of righteousness because they were obeying God. After the fall, what was the sign of righteousness? Sacrifice. They had to sacrifice. You know, when Noah came out of the ark, the first thing he did was built an altar. You know, he found favor in God's sight. He was accounted to him as righteousness. Abraham received another sign, a sign of circumcision. So for a while it was sacrifice and circumcision. We get to the time of Christ. Christ is saying that baptism is a sign of righteousness. That and being born of the Spirit. Those are signs of righteousness. And then after Christ's Christ, um, death on the cross, we didn't need sacrifice anymore. Paul's writing says that we need to be circumcised in the heart. Same thing is receiving the Holy Spirit because we are sanctified by the Spirit. And so now as we continue on, we have baptism of the water and the Holy Spirit. And at the final days, Eden's going to be restored, right? So what will be the sign of righteousness at that point in time? The seventh day, the Sabbath again. Eden's going to be restored. So, but at this time here, he's talking about the sign of righteousness. He's telling Nicodemus, you need to fulfill all that God has said. You need to be baptized by the water as a sign of righteousness, and you need to be baptized in your heart by the Holy Spirit. He says, only then will you truly see the kingdom of God? If that isn't our focus, if we're looking at worldly things, our our future is not secure. But he's telling here, let's look at the things that God requires. Your future is secure, and then you will understand what the kingdom of God is really like. So let's turn back to John. And if we continue reading, it says, humans, in verse 6, humans can only reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. 
And Nicodemus is saying, how are these things possible? And Jesus replied and says, are you a respected Jewish teacher and you don't understand these things? How many times do we say that we can quote scripture, we can do all sorts of, know all sorts of stuff, but we really don't understand? Until we have that relationship with God, how can we fully understand that? How many people have been beat up by the by somebody preaching the Bible? And how many of us have beat somebody else up by doing the same thing? When we fully understand it and we're fully converted, we won't have that problem. He says, how are these things possible? How do I get to that point? He's asking these things. He's, he's like, I don't, I don't understand what you're talking about. Verse 11, it says, I assure you, we tell you what we know and what we have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony but if you don't believe me, then I tell you about earthly things. How can you possibly believe it if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but one has. <clears throat> but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. So he's telling Nicodemus who he is. He says, I'm the Son of God. I've come down from heaven, and I'm telling you what the kingdom is like. He's telling Nicodemus that he is the Messiah. When you study about Nicodemus, Nicodemus was looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. And Jesus tells him, I am the one that you're looking forward to. And then he goes on to say, And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on the pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. The antidote. He says, look, you know the story of the, of, of the bronze snake and how it saved those that were bitten. And he says, Messiah is going to do the same. He's going to be lifted up and put on a pole also. And anyone that looks at him will have eternal life. And he's telling Nicodemus to look to him. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his only, one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him you know the Pharisees believed that God was like a, a judge with a gavel and just going to condemn everyone and that's how they treated people and he's saying you know Nicodemus you're not the one that's going to judge if the Son of Man that comes to save everyone isn't going to be judging them and condemning them the way that you think. Because God loves the world. And he loves it so much that he gave his only son. That those that look to him, those that really believe him, aren't going to die. They're going to be like the children of Israel in the wilderness, when they got bit by the venomous snake, they looked at him and lived. That's what Jesus was telling Nicodemus. And that's what Jesus is telling us today. That he is the antivenom for the serpent's bite. 
and that he is the one that was lifted up on the pole that anyone who gets bit by that snake can look to him and live. You know, we're all Nicodemuses at one time or another and that we need that true conversion, the baptism of the water and the spirit. You really can't have one without the other. And he says, your future is secure by looking to me. That's what Jesus is saying. Your future doesn't have to be shaky. You don't have to die from the snake bite. You can live. And you live by looking to Jesus. Because God loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him. That word believe means to really believe, to put it into action. Not, not just go, oh yeah, I believe it. This is putting it in action. By looking to him and saying, you know what? I've been bitten by the snake and I want to live. So I'm going to look to him. And I believe what he said that he can save me. That's what that word believe means. Not just a passive, oh, I believe it. Yeah, we can believe a lot of things, but we don't put it into action. But that's what that word means, to put it into action, to trust him and accept his gift of eternal life. My prayer for each of us today is that we look at these scriptures and we take and we, we put them into our own lives. How does this relate to us? And that we don't have to remain in the ignorant state that, that Nicodemus was in when he came to Jesus. And like Nicodemus, accept that free gift and look to him, to look to Jesus and live. Our closing song today is 516, All the Way My Savior Leads Me.
Our benediction today is taken from 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 through 13. This is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Anyone who has the Son has life. Anyone who does not have the Son does not have life. I have written all this to you so that you who believe in the name of the Son of God may be sure that you have eternal life. Amen.